In the summer of 2023, the encrypted communications that is considered vital for some military and law enforcement officers became exposed. TETRA, which stands for Terrestrial Trunked Radio Standard, is used worldwide by law enforcement agencies, military groups, and critical infrastructure providers. It uses Time Division Multiple Access, TDMA, for channel sharing, and is capable of carrying both voice and digital data. A cybersecurity firm, Midnight Blue, performed a publicly available detailed analysis of the Tetra standard and found serious vulnerabilities in its underlying cryptography. They disclosed the discovery of five zero days collectively known as Tetra Burst on stage at DEF CON 31. All right, hello and uh, welcome everybody to our talk, Tetra Tour de Force, jailbreaking digital radios and base stations for fun and secrets. I'm very excited to stand here today and share this research with you after working on it for more than uh, two years. My name is Jos Wetzels and these are my colleagues, Carla Meyer and Wouter Boxlock. And together we form Midnight Blue, a specialist security consultant for, consultancy firm that specializes mainly in embedded systems as well as critical infrastructure. So a little bit about Tetra. What is Tetra? It's a globally used radio technology that competes with the likes of P25, which you might know from being used by the United States Police, um, DMR and the confusingly named Tetrapol. It was standardized in 1995 by ETSI, that's the European Telecommunications Standards Institute, um, and they are known for also doing work on GSM, 3G, 4G and so on. It's used for voice and data communications, as well as machine-to-machine -machine communications, and it relies on secret proprietary cryptography. That's why we're standing here today. So it's um, the vast majority of global police forces outside of the United States and, and France use Tetra for their voice communications. And this is countries like the Netherlands and Germany and the United Kingdom, um, but also Scandinavian countries, Eastern Europe, uh, large parts of Asia and South America use this. In addition, it's used in military and intelligence services contexts. Now, the countries that you see highlighted on the map here are the ones where we could confirm military or intelligence users uh, through open source intelligence, but this is likely the tip of the iceberg, so there might be many more countries out there that use it in this capacity. And on top of that, it's used by critical infrastructure. So if you see private security forces at airports, harbors and train stations, there's a good chance that their handheld radios are Tetra based. And on top of that, it's also used as a radio link for wide area networks carrying SCADA communications in order to do telecontrol and telemetry of high voltage substations, oil and gas pipelines, as well as railway signaling. So, serious stuff. Fortunately, Tetra features a number of encryption methodologies, all proprietary. The researchers found the most serious vulnerabilities in TEA-1, which is primarily intended for commercial users and some countries like Iran. The other three encryption methods, TEA-2, TEA-3, and TEA-4, have different uses. TEA-2 is reserved for police and emergency services, military and intelligence users in Europe. TEA-3 is restricted to similar users in countries that are considered EU-friendly, countries such as Mexico and India. TEA-4 is another algorithm intended for commercial users, although according to Midnight Blue, it is hardly used. So back to that vulnerability in TEA-1, CVE-2022-24402. It essentially reduces the initial encryption key's entropy from 80 bits down to just 32 bits. This makes cracking the key trivial with anyone with modern laptop computing. The second demonstration shows how to decrypt communications of a TL1 encrypted network, commonly used by critical infrastructure and commercial parties. This should have been confidential. The demonstration is carried out by us on a real network. The attacker captures traffic and identifies messages on which to mount the attack. Now the attacker computes the key used on this frequency. This takes about a minute. The attacker can now decrypt all traffic or partake in voice or data communication. This should have been confidential. This vulnerability is relevant because experts are predicting something similar will happen with the advent of commercial quantum cryptography. 
we will have the ability to crack the encryption keys we use today for our online banking, our shopping, and for our national secrets in a matter of minutes. Fortunately, some very bright people are working now to prevent this from happening. And they'd better hurry. The ability for anyone to go to Google or Amazon and connect with a quantum computer is happening sooner than we may think. And soon, hundreds of logical qubits might be accessible from your laptop keyboard. This is the story of what happens when quantum cryptography is able to crack our existing encryption keys and what organizations need to be doing about that today. I'm Robert Bamosi. This is Error Code. My name is Dennis Mandish. I'm the CTO and co-founder of Crypt. We're a post-quantum security encryption systems company. Previously, I've talked with Skip Sanziri of QSecure in episode four about the basics of quantum computing. And then again in episode 20 about the use of quantum computing to secure satellites, even those satellites already in orbit. In this episode, I wanted to talk to Dennis about the notion that our present-day encryption might be vulnerable to quantum computing sooner rather than later. Yeah, Crypt was founded under the premise that quantum computers were scaling very quickly, faster than the cybersecurity industry was preparing for them. Both my co-founder and myself were from the CIA. We saw the scale of theft of IP in the last 10, 15 years, and we really wanted to do something about it that was durable. And we saw the transition to post-quantum cryptography, systems that are being advocated by NIST as being insufficient to guarantee that long-term cybersecurity that we really wanted to get to large enterprise. So just to clarify, we're going to be talking a little bit more about quantum cryptography as opposed to quantum in general. Yeah, we can talk about both. I'm a physicist, so happy to talk about quantum computing or quantum cryptography and anything in between. We should start with some definitions that we're going to be using. For example, why don't we talk about Shor's algorithm? So classical computers just operate using bits, zeros and ones. Of course, quantum computers use qubits, which are a superposition of a zero and a one, which really means that their power grows exponentially with each additional qubit that you add to to use for computation. And in the case of cryptography, the encryption systems that we use today are based on mathematically hard problems or what we believe were classically hard for computers that use those bit systems. But for quantum computers, they operate on this different system, which makes them immediately available for attack by something called Shor's algorithm. Shor's algorithm is a way of doing fast factorization of RSA. RSA is the primary algorithm that we use today for public key infrastructure, where Alice and Bob have different keys, one for encrypting data and one for decrypting it. And it's based on a really simple problem to, that you can think about is multiplying two large prime numbers together. That's really easy and fast for computers to do, but it's super hard and super difficult and almost requires brute force effort by computers to get them back into their original constituents to factorize them. And another definition, we should talk about Grover's algorithm. Grover's is a search algorithm. So it reduces the key strength of the other type of algorithms that we use. These are called AES Uh, or symmetric algorithms where you use the same key to both encrypt and to decrypt the data. So the fastest algorithms that we knew about until recently, before Grover's, was basically a brute force search through all the possible AES keys that could be used. Grover's algorithm reduces that by half, which means that a 256-bit key really has the security parameters of a 128-bit key. So if I'm hearing correctly, Quantum cryptography affects asymmetric more than symmetric encryption. That's technically true, but the problem here is is that almost all the symmetric keys that we use around the world today for every HTTPS section on the internet, for all of our secure messaging applications, everything is distributed using those asymmetric algorithms. So while the symmetric ones like AES may be perfectly quantum secure, even quantum safe, the fact that we distributed them 
using public key infrastructure and those broken asymmetric algorithms means that they're not really secure. It's a false sense of security to fall back on, oh, well, AES is still safe. Well, AES is only safe if you have a way of getting it to that endpoint where it's actually used for encryption and decryption. And I'm wondering if we could go a little deeper on that. How is asymmetric more vulnerable than symmetric? Yeah, because the asymmetric algorithms are based on mathematics that we don't know to be hard. That's a technical term in mathematics where there's a proof of how difficult this problem is. There's other words that you might have heard of, like the problems, like the traveling salesman problem, which are called NP complete and so on. There's no proof that any of these algorithms are at least that hard, which is the situation we're in today promoted by the government is to be crypto agile, meaning be prepared to replace those algorithms at any time in the future because they may fail. And we saw two monumental examples of finalists in that competition that just failed in less than a year ago. These were algorithms that we believe were very hard. One was called Rainbow and one was called Psych or Super Singular Isogenies. These were broken by regular laptop computers. They it was not a quantum computer, it's not a supercomputer. It was broken in the mathematics itself. And that could also happen with the ones that we have left today in this post-quantum cryptography contest that we're going through. All of this gets to the underlying threat to national security. Yeah, it's uh, the same algorithms that the U.S. government uses, right? So the U.S. government, you know, traditionally they were called Suite A and Suite B encryption tools. One is all the public ones you just mentioned, AES, RSA, all the recurves. These are available for a large enterprise or anyone on the internet to use. Then there's a secret set of tools where the algorithms are not published, but they're for specialized purposes, you know, rekeying satellites, the things that the governments really only do. So in the threat community, there's a lot of talk about harvesting now and decrypting later. You know, where the bad guys don't care that they can't see the information today. They're assuming that they'll have access to it tomorrow. Yeah, that's become a big deal just in the last few years since people started recognizing the quantum computing threat to all of our encryption systems. But the reality is, is that it's a very old technique. The entire Cold War uh, all the big governments use this very effectively. And they just harvested the data that they had access to. And sometimes that required proximity to a radio station or um, fiber optic cables that were being built at the time, or even the old copper cables that, that connected two bodies. So you had to be close to those systems to be able to collect that data, to find a flaw in it later, to be able to decrypt it. Well, today that's all off the table because that data is available from anywhere in the world over the internet. You don't have to go into Russia or Iran or North Korea to collect it anymore. You can just do it remotely. And that made it much easier for people to collect that data at the same time that price for storing that data went to almost zero and then hope to operationalize and monetize it in the future. And re remember that most of these breaks are not found by governments. They're found by researchers. They find a flaw in the randomness generation, so the keys are predictable. They find it in the implementation of the algorithms, the libraries. You're probably familiar with Heartbleed and SSL. These are colossal failures in the system. And that anyone who harvests the data that was based on the security of those systems can immediately now decrypt it without having done any of the homework themselves. And that's the thing. Harvest Now, Decrypt Later assumes that encrypted data stolen today can be decrypted by quantum computers tomorrow. Quantum computers that you can access from your laptop. But how likely of a scenario is that? Yeah, I think just for the Harvest Now, Decrypt Later piece, there's a lot of misconceptions about that. What it is, is someone, you know, is the Chinese government out to harvest, to attack my cell phone and collect all the data coming in on my cell phone? Well, well, yeah, maybe, but why would they bother? They're going to just hack into your cell phone and get everything directly from there. So what Harvest Now, Decrypt Later really means is these big scale systems where you have access to huge amounts of data and you could filter it out for the stuff that you really find high priority financial data health records government secrets and so on and then later on find out what's brute forceable with quantum computers what turns out to have had a massive cryptographic flaw that can be exploited maybe the random number generators not so random great examples of that in cryptocurrency so a guy called the ethereum bandit discovered that some of these 
uh, e-wallets had a really bad random number generator. Instead of a 256-bit number, it was the number one, it was the number two. And so he got away with 25 million in Ethereum before anyone noticed that, look, there's a really big problem here and it's costing us real money. It's the same, the same logic that goes behind harvesting data. It costs almost nothing to store it. You know it's going to be useful in the future, especially if it has IP or financial data, things that don't change very quickly over time. And in regards to which countries are doing it, the United States, sure, we, we did it for decades. But the purposes were for preventing World War III, for collecting military data and that kind of thing. It wasn't to take IP from some company in Germany and give it to Google to get richer. But that is the whole premise behind the Chinese government's motivation behind a lot of this. It's to collect that IP, give it to Chinese companies to put US Inc. out of business. And it's been surprisingly effective. If you look at what General Alexander said a little more than a decade ago when he was head of the NSA, it's the single greatest transfer of wealth from one country to another in human history. So there's one flaw that I can think of with this harvest now and decrypt later, and that is it assumes that they're going to have access to a quantum computer. Yeah, and most of the industry believes that quantum computers will be available as a cloud resource, the same way you go to the cloud to get virtual machines, containerized operations for your software, for data storage, all those things. You will go to the cloud, to use a quantum computer. You don't have to own one. Nobody wants to have a cryostat in their basement that costs $20 million to operate. Whoa. Okay. So in previous shows, I've been thinking that you would have your own quantum computer in your home. But no, this is going to be something that's going to be farmed out. You're going to go into the cloud and have access to quantum computing. You can do it now. IBM has made their smallest quantum computers available through their cloud. And they made all the software to use them available today. Of course, they're too small to break encryption, but that's the plan. The Googles of the world don't want you to have to own some quantum hardware and hire a bunch of physicists to make it work. They're going to make it available to you very cheaply over the internet by how much uh, compute resources you use. The same way that they use virtual machines now, the same way we use uh, AWS, Amazon Web Services, exact same model. And to stay on that tangent a bit, Microsoft is developing something slightly different from what Google and IBM and others are doing. The Marjana particle is not so relevant then in this case if something that can be conceptualized in the cloud and executed in the cloud is available. Yeah, they will have to build the physical hardware and just make it remotely accessible the same way we access cloud servers today. It's just Uh another piece of hardware. Okay. You don't have to understand how to program the quantum computer, just like you don't have to understand how to program all the transistors that are in your laptop today. You only you know, plug in a bunch of numbers to a simple Python program, and it runs everything for you. You won't write the software for sure. It's algorithm. It'll be packaged for you. So if it's in the cloud, if it's a SaaS model, it really doesn't matter how the particles are behaving and whether or not you can contain them properly. Yeah, the, the cloud, all it does is make those resources available to you, the physical resources down at the quantum computer level. But all the programming, all the control mechanisms, they're abstracted away to the users. Anyone who's using a quantum computer today, even the guys at IBM that are programming them, they've never seen the hardware. They've never even gotten close to it. Like I said, they've made it very easy to use over the cloud right now. They've got the lessons on there. They've got the software you can use for free every month. And it's a very fast way to learn how to get access to them. And that's what's coming in the very near future. That's how most supercomputers in the world work today. Nobody's physically at the site. All the researchers are scattered around the world running their experiments. So again, like a high-performance computer or a supercomputer, I don't have to have physical access to it. I can access it from my home. And certainly for a a resource like this, no company is going to need it. Well, maybe I'm... I'm not predicting the future here, but no company needs a quantum computer for 24-7. They need it for an hour a day or a week or whatever it is to run their calculations for whatever the application is. Maybe it's modeling new drugs for the pharmaceutical industry. That's a, a partial resources that they should rent from the Googles and the Amazons of the world rather than having to have the expense of owning it themselves. The problem, though, is is competition, is that the companies or countries that have access to quantum computers first, 
they have an insurmountable market advantage over everyone else. When you can do drug discovery and modeling in the pharmaceutical industry or financial industry modeling for trading algorithms faster than someone else, in many cases, a problem that cannot be solved any other way, you put everyone else out of business, you are first. And that's why there's such a race globally between China, US, Europe, and so on, is that they want to dominate those industries. So then with the harvest now and decrypt later, the bad guy would just simply purchase some time in the cloud. Absolutely. And why wouldn't you? It's an easy, cheap way to do it. But real in reality, lessons learned from the Cold War is that any country that has a colossal advantage like that, an intelligence gathering, an exploitation advantage, they don't make it public. They keep it a secret as long as possible. And if you look at even during the Cold War, when the U.S. did this, when they were able to break the Soviet ciphers and encryption systems that they used to communicate with the nuclear spies in the United States, you know, the, the, we had the Manhattan Project in the United States, then the nuclear spies, of course, gave up many of those secrets. They were you know, held accountable in court and executed later. Uh, the reality is that the way that that was done was not publicly known until the 1990s, and exactly what they did to be able to decrypt all that information. Same thing will happen today. You look at, you know, just even recent history, like, like Stuxnet, no one's come out and taking credit for that. And that technology was basically science fiction when uh, it was first discovered, right? No one, there was no cybersecurity researcher in the world who ever imagined something like that was possible. I mean, they can go back and rewrite history now and say, oh yeah, I predicted that in 2005, but it's not true. So with quantum computing today, what we measure is in qubits and the maximum number of qubits is floating around the low hundreds. Is that correct? It's a few hundred depending on who you believe. And then we know privately that some com com companies have disclosed that they have 1 million uh, qubit machines that they'll make publicly available in the next year or two. So earlier in 2023, there was talk about a Chinese paper that speculated that you had to have 372 qubits in order to break RSA. Apparently that's not necessary or that's not true. Yeah, so th this is a slightly longer explanation. So there, there are logical qubits and then there are physical qubits. You need lots of physical qubits as a general statement to make one logical qubit. Some systems, they're equal. You need one logical qubit for one physical qubit. But here, there are papers assuming 370 logical qubits but nothing has been proven. There's been speculation about some of the research in there as well. I'm not an expert on that, but nobody has taken it very seriously. Really the minimum number of qubits, logical qubits that you need to break something like RSA is about double the security problem. So if you want to break RSA 2048, you need a little over 4,000 logical qubits. Now IBM's machine, for example, is you, know, you need a, you know, tens of thousands of physical qubits to get one logical qubit. Whereas other computing systems, it's a much smaller number. So again, these cloud systems, they're not necessarily using the physical qubits, they're using the logical qubits. Yeah, to perform an operation, you don't care about how many physical qubits there are. You only want to know how many logical ones are available to you for performing Shor's algorithm. It's abstracted away from you. You will never see anything on the physical side. You won't know how those systems are connected together. You'll just see the operating system. So the companies that are offering the cloud services, they would have the quantum farms as it would be a physical unit. However, whether they're doing it Microsoft's way or someone else's way doesn't really matter to you because you're looking at the logical qubits at the other end. And that's really what you're concerned about, the logical qubits, when you want to run a drug program or you want to, say, run a stock portfolio or whatever. It's like we use regular internet tools today. We use Excel spreadsheet. We have no idea how that was programmed or what the math is at the transistor level behind it. We don't care. We just want to make sure it adds, subtracts, and multiplies correctly. So we've seen a lot about artificial intelligence, AI, or what they're calling or branding AI. Really, they're just language learning models. And they're basically doing machine learning at a glorified level. So this is kind of an interim state for AI. I'm kind of wondering now, is the same thing happening with quantum? 
that what we're talking about today is basically an interim and that there's yet another stage beyond? Yeah, with artificial intelligence, it was never really clear you know, from the 1980s or, or 90s even when they started developing the ideas and, and trying to commercialize some of it, that there was going to be a really big market advantage or any reason for it. It sounded cool for a Star Trek movie, uh, maybe chat bots for a customer service and all that. But the reality is very different for quantum. It's provably an insurmountable market advantage in many industries. And if you get there first, you're at the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. You're making money right away. And there's a long line of people, virtually every Fortune 500 company has a program to use those when they become available for whatever reason. It might even be making better bar- batteries for Tesla. It- it's a whole host of problems, many of which are completely unsolvable without a quantum computer, meaning no matter how many classical computers you have, and I like to throw this number out, is if you turned every atom in the universe into a supercomputer, it would not be as powerful as a very small quantum computer with just a few hundred logical qubits. That's how powerful quantum computers are. That's how fast the exponent scales when you add qubits. Okay, we've mentioned the traveling salesman problem. Is there another example that would be an insurmountable problem that a conventional computer could not perform today, but a quantum computer could? Yeah, any any problem that involves the hard math, something that's in that category that quantum computers are, are very good at, that can never be solved any other way. Meaning that... If if it's true that factoring large uh, numbers, for example, let's say not two, three, four thousand uh, digit numbers, but a million numbers, uh, was considered a, a truly hard problem, then that could never be done, no matter how many classical computers you had, and even certainly with ten thousand, it would be impossible because we know exactly how fast they operate, we know exactly how much energy it takes to flip a single transistor switch, and so on. So, if that's never solvable, no matter how many classical computers we have, then a quantum computer can absolutely do it. We just have to scale them a little bit larger than they are today. Flipping that around, are there problems that would not be appropriate for a quantum computer? Yeah, doing this video call or video games, that's not going to get any faster with quantum computers. That's not what they're good at. We're we're always going to have classical computers. It's just the kinds of problems that quantum computers are good at are very different than the kinds of problems that we're doing today. Some, it's, it's that gray area in between that they're just more efficient you know, computationally or in the amount of energy resources that they use to solve a certain problem, even though a classical problem can, a computer could do it. So there's a simple cost issue there as well. You know, do I need a small quantum computer the size of my bedroom or do I need a supercomputer the size of a football field? That's a really simple calculus. Both could do the problem. One is just more efficient and faster at doing it. So let's talk about post-quantum algorithms. NIST has been soliciting these and testing them. And last summer, in July of 2023, they released four candidates. Two of them fell out. They were cracked. So it's not boding too well. I'm wondering, are there going to be other rounds? This is the final round before they're called the third round candidates that they will be standardized in 2024, as early as January 2024. Some have speculated it might be earlier based on what's going on in cybersecurity today. But we're fairly certain that sometime in 2024, we will have that one key exchange or key encapsulation mechanism algorithm. It's called Kyber, uh, replace RSA and elliptical curves going forward. The other ones have to do with signatures. And the the issue is that there will be a fourth round after this because there isn't enough diversity among the algorithms. They're more or less based on lattices, the the hardness of the lattice problem. And Psyche, the other one, like Kyber, that would be used for key exchange, was broken. It was broken hard in such a way that there's nothing else behind it right now. So we're stuck with one algorithm. There's no proof of hardness. We have to transition from RSA and elliptical curves to this, but we really don't know how long it will last or if it'll even be broken next year before it's standardized. So encapsulation, I'm wondering, is that like IPsec? It's something that's tunneling or some sort of covering over the existing encryption? So, so encapsulation is to take those symmetric keys like AES and to distribute them with the asymmetric algorithms. 
So you encrypt it with the public key and you decrypt it with the private key. You've encapsulated the symmetric key inside. You don't use that mechanism for encrypting data. You use it for uh, getting keys from one end to another. And that symmetric key is what you actually use for data. The other problem with that design is that it's really a 1970s architecture when there was two points communicating between uh, a couple of copper wires and a couple of switches. That that's not the world that we live in today. We live in a virtualized, containerized cloud environment. We can connect to any data center world across multiple different avenues. We don't rely on any single path. So given that there will be some algorithm in 2024 that we're required to use by NIST, are there other things that could be done to secure the enterprises and national secrets and so forth? Yeah, we Crypt has a completely different and more modern approach to the 1970s architecture that is public key infrastructure. We're saying like, look, we have all these resources around the world, data centers and fiber and satellite communication systems everywhere. We need to create a system that's absolutely redundant and resilient against anything like a failure of an algorithm, the failure of a library, the failure of an implementation. So, so what Crypt has done is modeled largely on what you might have heard is called quantum key distribution, where you have a physical appliance at two endpoints separated by an unbroken piece of fiber. We've taken that same type of model and virtualized it and made it available through the cloud, where we have a constellation of quantum entropy sources. These are distributed in multiple different data centers in geographically uh, diverse regions with different legal jurisdictions and so on. We make those available at any endpoint using those same public key algorithms but in a very different way. Those are now used to distribute a small amount of metadata instead of exchanging keys. They tell you how to access data those random numbers from the cloud and then assemble them with cryptographic extractors at the endpoints. So you get the keys at the endpoints that you need for that symmetric data encryption piece, but it's decoupled from the channel that the data is used in, for example, WhatsApp or something like that. And it's also never in flight. The keys are assembled at the endpoint rather than distributed to the endpoint. That's the fundamental difference. So on the issue of asymmetry and symmetry, are we talking about the days of Diffie-Hellman being over? It's now. It is now? Because, yeah, because even now we don't uh, consider that uh, durable for the long term, which is the whole term crypto agility assumes that this mechanism is broken and will be broken again just because we swapped out one algorithm that we know is quantum broken with one that we don't know doesn't give us any security assurances that are durable. So the government has told us that we have to be prepared to hot swap these at any point in the future if there is a break or if there's an upgrade to another type of algorithm. What we're saying is that that mechanism is not enough. You know, maybe a password was enough to protect us as our single point of authentication to a network back in the 80s and 90s, but no one would accept that today. We shouldn't accept the same idea and the same concept in our cryptographic systems. So how might government regulation fit into all of this? Or is it still speculative at this point? Yeah, this this is a this is a major problem that the government can't solve on its own. It's you know it, SEAL Team Six is a great t shirt that says, you know, it's no one's coming. It's up to us. It, it's really up to industry. The government is not inventing things that are the industry is going to adopt. The government didn't invent these algorithms that were transitioning to and ask for the industry leaders to submit them for review and peer review by everyone, not just the government. It's the same thing with the situation. We can't let something like this persist much longer when we've suffered so much economic damage in this country. This is a national economic security industry issue that we have to solve from the ground up, not from the top down. And so it's going to come from academics. It's going to come from large enterprises. Yeah, we have to do all of those things. You know, the government may have their own quantum computing program, and, and we know that they do, actually. But it's really the Googles, the IBM, PsyQuantum, and other people that are driving this industry quickly forward. Sure, one of those technologies, one of their qubit designs is likely to win above all the others, but it has to be a lot of people trying a lot of different things to see what is most effective. It's the same way with cybersecurity and cryptographic infrastructure. We can't be beholden to these issues that we don't find out for 10 or 20 years. Oh, by the way, all of your data was easily accessible and broken. There was just a major one in Europe uh, in the last week known as uh, Tetra. So there's a massive global uh, communication system for 
for first responders, for the military, for police, and so on. It's our radio system. And here in the US, we mostly use something called P25, but the European standard is uh, called Tetra. And that's deployed to over 100 company, countries worldwide, virtually every single nuclear power, China, Russia, uh, Iran, and so on. And it was just discovered that there's been a 25-year-old weakness in the cryptography in that system, meaning that that could now be exploited now that it's public and everyone knows it. And all the radios that have been developed and used and deployed for 25 years, all that data that was collected can immediately be operationalized. People can insert uh, nefarious traffic mm -hmm. uh, content that they want. They can listen to communications, see our first responders, uh, what they do during a terrorist attack. This is the same type of system that we see in the regular IT infrastructure that we see today. We don't know what's in a lot of these black boxes and when it will be discovered that there's a flaw that's exploitable. And that's the system that we have to get away from. These single points of failures must go away permanently. We have to replace them with redundancy and resiliency. So crypto agility comes into play. Yeah, that's an absolute minimum. Even the government has demanded that. And the government's really driving a lot of this change. So multiple national security memorandums, multiple executive orders, legislation, HR 7535, uh, have mandated that the government and every U.S. federal government agency by 2035 will have transitioned to post-quantum cryptography, replacing all these quantum insecure systems. There's no waiver for that. And what that really means is that all of the hardware and software vendors to the U.S. government must transition as well. That's all of us. So this is driven top down, this piece of it, be crypto agile, be prepared to replace it. But here's what you're going to use today. That has to continue going forward, but driven from industry, not the government. So that's an interesting point. Even though the logical quantum bits are going to be in the cloud, your computer, your laptop will have to crunch the key. And at the moment, our current laptops, they're not capable of crunching the keys. The computing resources for these new algorithms are different than the ones we use today. They're more computationally intensive. So some of the algorithms require massive key size, when it's called the CLEIS. And that has key sizes in many orders of magnitude larger than what we're using today. And even for Kyber and some of the signature algorithms, they use more CPU time and power than the ones that we had even 10 years ago. So a lot of this has to be upgraded over time just to do the encryption piece, never mind the quantum computing piece, which is a completely separate issue. Those will not be on our laptops. Yeah, for what Crypt does, it, it doesn't use any more resources than what the existing standards or the future standards will use. So we're compliant with the new standards. We'll make use of them, but in a very different way that takes away that single point of failure that destroys the possibility of harvest now and decrypt later by the giant vacuum cleaner in the sky. We don't know where this goes. We don't know how the story ends, but we have to do something about it now. Yes, the transition to post-quantum cryptography is a great first step. It stops a lot of the bleeding and stops a lot of the potential exploitation in the future, but we have to do much more. It, it really is a national security issue beyond just the economic cost to us. Hey, if you're enjoying Error Code, tell a friend. I'm sure there are other people out there who like narrative information security podcasts. And I'd really like to hear from you. DM me at robertvamosi at infosec.exchange on Mastodon and tell me what you like and even what you don't. I've got some great stories coming up, including one about railroads and OT and, of course, more IoT. Subscribe today. I don't want you to miss out.